the, uh, the kingdom pattern, uh, how we are to, to lead and um, mobilize the people um, according to the pattern of the kingdom. Do you know in uh, Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 to 26, Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 to 26 is the story of um, Moses' brother, uh, sorry, father-in-law Jethro. And I'm sure we all know that story, how that Jethro came to see Moses and he said to him, the thing you're doing is not good. He said, you can't deal with this, this huge thing all on your own. You, you haven't got, you're not the, the whole package. No person is the whole package. No person can do it all. And, um, and so what, what Moses' uh, father-in-law did was he put a structure in place. And so we know that the structure was that they put, had leaders of tens, leaders of fifties, leaders of hundreds, leaders of thousands. And so in the, in the Western church, we have, we have taken this on board as the pattern. And so then we have small groups. And the leaders of the small groups are, are the leaders of tens, you know. And then we have coordinators of, of a few small groups and they're the leaders of 50. And then we have um, maybe a, a staff pastor or an area pastor or something that oversees all of that and they're leaders of, hun of hundreds. But then we have, you know, we've got mega churches who have leaders of thousands, you know. And so we've used the structure and it's a biblical structure. But you know what? In the kingdom of God, structure alone is not the key. And so, if if um, if, if we're patterning ourselves on the on the Western Church, then we will we will have great structure. Isn't that true? Yes. We will, because the Western Church has become specialists in church structure. Yeah. And then we become specialists in titles. Mm. Mm. Everyone's got a title. Yeah. So then everybody is clamoring for a title. Mm -hmm. Because you've got a ministry and you've got position and you've got respect and you have influence and you have power as long as you've got a title and you know where you fit in the structure. True? So then here's the thing. If it's all about the structure and where we fit in the structure and what our title is and, and therefore what power and influence comes with that, and I'm, I'm going to talk about extremes because if I talk about extremes, then you'll understand uh, very clearly what's black and white. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and so some things I'm going to say will appear to be extreme, but that's okay, right? Because it's to help us to separate things. Yes. Does that make sense? All right. So if it's all about our structure and where we are in the structure, then we simply become like the world we live in. That's right. Like any business organization, any community organization or NGO or whatever, that has its structure. And do you know what then happens in our churches or our ministries? People are trying to climb the ladder to success within the structure. Yeah? Yep. And so we as leaders, then we have a problem. Because we end up with people wanting our job. True. Not realizing that if they get our job, they may not have the grace for it. It may not be their calling. Yeah. It may not be where God wants them. Yeah. But all of that is out of the picture if we have come to the place where it's about my position and the structure and my title and therefore my influence and authority, you know, and, and my significance in all that. And the last thing we want in the kingdom of God is to have people competing for position. True. True? It's not what the kingdom is about. Jesus said, in the kingdom it shall not be so. The Gentiles do these things this way, but not amongst you. But you know what we've done in the Western world since the 80s? We have actually gone to the Philistines yes. to sharpen our axes. That's right. And we have adopted the ways of the, the world we live in and found scriptures like Ex Exodus 18 and said, this is the word of God. And all we've done is use the word of God to justify That's using right. the world's means. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Wow. Come on, brother. True? Yeah. Am I rattling your cage yet? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I, I believe this to be true. So you know the story in the Old Testament where the, the, the Philistines overran Israel and they took all their weapons of war from them, left them with their, their cultivation implements, but then they took away the sharpening stones so that the people of Israel were completely um, oppressed. 
And they had to go to the Philistines to sharpen their implements to be able to till the ground properly and to grow their crops. So they were completely dependent on the Philistines. Do you know, since the 80s in the church, particularly the Western world, we have, uh, we have uh, capitulated to the world system because we've seen things like Exodus 18 and we've said, well, this is just like what the world's doing, but they're doing it better than us. So let's go to them and find out how to do this really well. So now we have senior pastor, yep. senior associate pastor, associate, 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 associate pastors, <laughs> assistant pastor, youth pastor, youth women's pastor. pastor, prayer pastor, teaching pastor, and on and on it goes. And we've got this whole structure with all these titles, and most of the people in there are not pastors at all. That's true. 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 <laughs> True, eh? Hey? You're an evangelist, but for years you've been called a pastor. Wrong. <laughs> yeah. I was called pastor for years. I'm not a pastor. I love people, but I'm not a pastor. <laughs> you see, if we just take the structure without the life and power of God, and without the, 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 the right grace flowing through it, then we're going to find the structure alone is not going to produce supernatural outcomes. So then, then what's our alternative? We either get on our faces before God and find out what He really wants in addition to that biblical structure, or we're going to go to the world who's doing it better than us, which is what we did from the 80s. So, what we've got then is we've got mega churches that look successful, but the longer those churches go, I'll tell you what's, what's beginning to uh, materialise. Firstly, George Barter has written a book after researching mega churches in the US. Yeah. And they have discovered that it doesn't matter how big the church is, it can be tens of thousands of people. But on the basis of what I've just been talking about, if it's that kind of church, then they are not influencing their city at all. Not one bit of influence in their city. So they can have wonderful buildings, great training programs, great teaching, preaching, you know, great youth and kids programs, have all the stuff going on, thousands of people coming, and they're not actually changing the city at all. Because the structure alone cannot do it, it's the power of God that does it. And it's the, it's the grace on the different members of the fivefold being That's released right. and working right. together that produces change. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And so, um, Jethro came and gave Moses one part of the puzzle. But we've run off with that part of the puzzle and said, this is it. All we've got to do is be better organized, better structured, and have everybody fitting into the structure properly, have this pastor, that pastor, all these other pastors. <laughs> Find out everybody's gifting and get, get, get them working, you know, and get them fulfilling my vision. Because yeah. my vision is the vision. Because I'm at the top of this thing. <laughs> so if I'm at the top, then everybody serves my vision. And everybody else's vision doesn't really matter as long as they're serving my vision. Come on, folks, you know that this is true. Right? Yeah. And while I'm talking extremes, you know what I'm saying is true. Yeah. Right? yeah. Do you know what? If the church is built on my vision, my church is in trouble. Very much so. But if it's built on the king's vision, yeah. man, we've got great possibilities. Yeah. It's not my vision. For, in our church, it's not my vision. It's God's vision. Yeah. You know? And so, I just happen to be the person that has a responsibility before God yeah. to lead it. Yes. But it's not my vision. Mm. It's His vision. Mm -hmm. If it's His vision, then He's responsible to resource it. I don't have to chase money. That's true. If it's His vision, He's responsible for all the people needed in it. I don't have to go looking for people to do things, you know? God brings them, because He knows what's needed. And I will tell you time and time again in the life of our church, that's what God's done. We just yeah. pray and say, Lord, you know what we need. Yeah. You know we need this kind of people in our church. You know we need a person for this. But then sometimes God surprises us. He brings people, and we suddenly discover that they've got certain gifts and abilities and passion and calling and whatever, and we go, wow, that's going to add so much. 
Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we're not trying to put people into our structure. We actually want to be, build big people and see them become fruitful to fulfill his kingdom vision in the context of, of our church and, our, and what we're doing in our city and yep. across the world. Yep. So it's a whole different paradigm. Yes. You know, we don't fundraise. No. We don't. Let me tell you a story. In 2010, we did a major community event. And this is what God told us to do. To do it out in, in a... You know, in a field, and to invite all the community organisations to come together. And the way things work here in Australia is if you do a community day, then you go to, to uh, the schools and community organisations and churches and businesses and so on, and you say, look, we're doing this big event. Um, you know, you can, you can pay to have this, this site on the property to put up your own display and promote yourself. All right? Yeah. And so... Uh, and, and, and it's all about uh, doing something for the community but making money out of it. We, we did a different thing. We said we want businesses, churches, schools, uh, community organisations, whoever, to, have to, to come and be a part of this. We want to connect our community together and we didn't charge anybody anything. We said it's free. Free to get in, free to promote yourself, your own business or whatever. It's free. So different ones of us were going to organisations in the community, and um, and we were, um, you know, we, we were actually telling them this. People would say, "But how much does it cost?" We would say, "It doesn't cost anything. It's free. Hmm. You can come and promote your business. We want you to promote your business. We want you to promote your school or your church or whatever. You know, we want the community to know you're here." We're doing this because, because it's about the kingdom of God and, and we want to multiply the good things that are in our community. And we want our community to know. And so you can't, you can't have, demonstrate the generosity of the kingdom if you ask people for money. <laughs> so we didn't go out and ask people to pay for it. We offered it to them for free. Do you know businesses would say, look, sorry, but we can't do anything that weekend. But we'll help you, they wrote me a check. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Do you know, the whole thing got paid for, and we're offering everything for free. We don't go out and fundraise. The kingdom's about a spirit of generosity. So you can have the best structure in the world, the best dream and vision in the world, you can be the most successful in man's eyes, but you know what? Unless there is the, the spirit of the kingdom flow. You understand what I'm saying? Because then you get into a supernatural zone. Do you know that the favour we have with the school where our church meets every Sunday is because of that, what we did in that, on that day. Because it impacted the principal's life so much that he promoted our church. <laughs> yeah. You see, the kingdom is, is contrary to the world we live in. But we've bought into the world's way of doing things. We've got to fundraise. We've got to get Western money. We've got to, you know, we've got to do this, got to do that. And everyone's going to suit my vision. And we're going to have the structure really right. We're going to have our promotions right. And all. No. There is a whole different way in the kingdom. Do you know, you don't need the world's money. If you're not from the West, you don't need the West's money. No. Because if the kingdom principles are true, and if the kingdom is what Jesus said it is, then it's going to function exactly the same in every economy in the world. In India now, in the networks that we have over there, all the churches are becoming completely self-sufficient. They are not looking for Western money. We tell them we don't give money. <laughs> we'll, we'll fund their effort to go, but we don't give any money to it for anything. Because we want to prove that the kingdom principles work in India the same as they work in Australia. Yes. And I'm going to talk about this a bit, a bit more later on, uh, in, in, and I'll probably come back to this time and time again, because, you know, the, the culture of the kingdom transcends all other cultures. It does. The economy of the kingdom transcends every economy. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the exchange rate is between here and your nation, you do not need our money. You need what the kingdom's about. <laughs> yeah. Truth. Yes. It's true. Yes. Because the, 
And, and we're seeing this all over the world, where people are coming to understand the kingdom and getting a revelation and, and, and positioning themselves under the apostolic grace. Then there is something that flows that causes their, their ministry to be self-sufficient within their economy. And you know, our churches in India, they are, um, they are funding their own orphanages now. They're funding their own education programs, their own feeding programs, their own children's things and so on. Because they've stepped into the supernatural zone of the kingdom. They're no longer just about the Jesuo principle. They have realized that there is something else that must be added to it in order for it to be the kingdom of God at work. And that there is something that has to flow in the structure if it's going to produce kingdom outcomes. Now we can grow things the world's way, but we'll never, never enjoy and understand um, you know, the supernatural aspect, really, of the kingdom. We might see miracles of healing and stuff like that, but there are miracles that are way beyond miracles of healing. Yeah, there is. There are other miracles God wants to do, which is why I'm going to continue to share things with you about our, that are our testimonies, because as I do, what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit's going to begin to speak to you about the possibilities of the, the supernatural outworking of the kingdom in your life, your ministry, your church, your nation. Amen? So in Exodus 18, it was about structure. When we go to Numbers chapter 11, God does something completely different. God says to Moses, this is Numbers 11, 16 to 17. God says to Moses, gather 70, the 70 elders who you know and who are recognized as leaders amongst the people. So they've got the structure in place. And they've had the structure in place for some time, but now God's teaching them about how it's supposed to really work as far as his kingdom is concerned. And what he told, them, told him to do was, he said, gather these guys to yourself. You, they must be elders you know, and the people must respect them as elders only. And then he said, I'm going to put the same spirit that I put on you, Moses, I'm going to put on them. You see, this is the missing element in the church growth movement. This is the missing element in the mega church, um, you know, think, you know, bias today that's out there today, but because it's about the spirit that God puts upon us. Now, this is not just the Holy Spirit in a general sense. This is about the grace that He puts on us, the specific grace upon us, and then those who position themselves with us will be come under the umbrella of that grace. And you see, the grace is the enabling. The grace is the, the thing that attracts people. The grace is the thing that, that uh, changes lives. The grace is the thing that produces supernatural outcomes. And so God said to Moses, you've, you've got this great structure in place. It's all happening and it's all great except that there's a, something that's got to flow in this structure and it's got to be the same spirit that, that I put on you, Moses, has got to flow to the 70 elders and then from them flow to the other leaders and down into the nation. Now the number 70 is very important. 70 is the, the, the number in the Bible for nation building, for kingdom building. All right? Um, you know, Jesus drew the 12 disciples to himself, and then, they, then he at some point stopped calling them disciples and started to call them his apostles. True? He sent them out. And then, of course, he sent out the 70. Now, some translations say, you yeah, know, maybe it was 72. No, it wasn't. That's the Western mindset. But it's got to be 6 times 12. <laughs> it's actually 70. Do you know why? In the Jewish mindset, that would have been very significant that he sent out 70. Because 70, on, the, on, on a, a group of 70, you build a nation. Jesus was was actually demonstrating that he, he was here to not only tell them the kingdom of God was near or had come close to them, but that he'd actually come to establish his kingdom and that he now had the foundation to establish the kingdom with 70. So the 12 were the, you know, the uh, 12 apostles of the Lamb. They were the ones who, who were called to actually rule the, the original church. But he signaled the fact that he was here to establish and build his kingdom by sending out the 70. And we see here back in Numbers 11 that um, um, Moses had this great structure, but things changed when God said, gather 70 elders 
and I'm going to put on them the same spirit I put on you. Do you know it's the flow of the Spirit of God and it's the flow of the unique grace that is on our lives as leaders that is the key to life flowing in the structure. And it's the key to the supernatural flowing in the structure. It's the key to revelation flowing in the structure. It's the key to, uh, to kingdom outcomes. It's the key to um, God doing things beyond us. It's the key to God's ways being higher than our ways. It's the keys to God's thoughts being greater than our thoughts and us actually understanding and knowing those things. And so the challenge is to not just have a structure, the challenge is to actually have the, the grace of God flowing in that structure. And it's the unique grace that he's put on your life as a leader. And ultimately the, the, the critical mass that changes things is when you have the nation building body, which is 70. That's the biblical pattern. Whereas what we've done is we've said, well, okay, as long as if I'm the senior guy, as long as I've got a good 2IC, and then I've got all these other people, you know, pastoring this, that, and everything else, and, and then we've got all these people serving in all these areas, then we're okay, we've just got to have a good promotional machine, we've got to have some miracles and get people saved, and, you know, let's grow this thing. But we may end up just with a structure, and like, unfortunately, some church movements that are now talking about atmosphere rather than about the presence of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And who are attracting people and keeping them just by a good light show and smoke machines and, and, and uh, humorous preaching, which is more like motivation, motivational motivation. speech. You know? Do you know, Jesus never calls to be motivational speakers. He calls to teach the Word of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Yeah. Why? Because it's the Word that is a two-edged sword. That's yeah. it. Yeah. It's not motivational speaking that's going to change lives. No. It's the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Amen? Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, and so this is the kingdom pattern. That firstly there is a structure. But then there's got to be the right thing flowing in the structure. And it's not just the Spirit of God in a general sense. It is actually the grace that God puts on the leader. Now this is not about cloning people. We've seen this in the past where, where churches uh, and ministries have a certain style, you know, and so therefore all the leaders and pastors yeah. in that church all dress the same, act the same, speak the same, they're just clones of the leader. Yeah? yeah? I'm not talking about cloning. <laughs> and God's not talking in the Bible about cloning. But I want to tell you something, there is a, there is a sound in the spirit that is yeah. the same, yeah. where the same grace is yeah, not you understand the difference? Yeah. And do you know what? If we're, tuned in, if we're attuned to the Holy Spirit, we can tell when it's the same sound. But we can tell when the sound is different. And we can tell when it's just a structure and everybody's clothes. <laughs> yeah. It's a very different thing. Amen? And so this is the, the, um, the, the starting point and the key to the kingdom pattern is the fact that, yes, there are structures and they're important because we people... Um, we need people to bear, bear the burden with us, which is what the Bible says in both of these occasions. The structure means that there are people to bear the burden with us, but then the grace that is on us that flows to others actually adds a supernatural dimension to the people bearing the burden with us. All right? So you can have the natural bearing of the burden with you, but it's better to have also the supernatural bearing of the burden. Yeah? And that's the kingdom pattern. And, um, and, and, and the thing about this is that when it's just about having a team that is full of clones of us, all right, that doesn't mean we have unity. No. Because that's an external thing. They learn how to you know, speak the same way, you know, <laughs> yeah. do things the same way, have the same style, dress the same, same haircuts, you know. I've seen it all. Yes. <laughs> yes, we have. I don't want to have clones of me. Not in my church and not in my network around the world. No way in the world. Because it's not about people being clones of the leader. It's about us actually releasing people into the calling that God's placed on their lives and covering them and, and resourcing them and, and having something of the grace of God flowing so that everybody under our grace can actually fulfill their calling and be fruitful and fulfill in doing it. And, and there should be unique expressions everywhere, you know? You know, when I go to Francis's church, I don't, I don't tell him what to do, unless he asks me. <laughs> 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 I 
But you know, it's not about telling people what to do. I do it this way, you've got to do it this way. No. But what happens is that there's something that transacts, there's something that flows, a deposit is left behind, revelation flows, yep. strategies come, yep. you know? And there's times when I'll say, look, I think this is a wise thing to do. You know, this is maybe what needs to be happen as follow-up to what God, God's doing now or whatever. But the fact is, it's about a grace that's flowing. Yes. And if the grace is flowing out, then kingdom outcomes take place. Yes. Yeah. And, and you can't make those things happen. God makes those things happen. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it's surprising and, it's a, it's, yeah. and you rejoice when you see them happen because you... It's undeniable that's the Spirit of God at work. But the key is that we need to understand how to gather people around us who will learn how to come under the grace so that we don't just have a structure. And also the structure's got to be different anyway. Because it's about, in our, in our churches and ministries, it's about the fivefold. It's not about gifts, it's about callings. All right? And we need to identify the callings and the giftings will take care of themselves. True. Because the gifts are like the tools that a tradesman has. You know, I did a trade as a carpenter when I was a young man. And, um, you know, one of the things I know is this. I can be very good at using a saw. And I could go out to a pile of timber and I can cut all those pieces of timber, cut them really well. The cuts can be square and really nice and smooth. And I can cut all those pieces of timber and have perfect cuts everywhere and all that I'll have is a pile of cut timber. True. <laughs> True? Because yeah. my gift in using a saw is not the issue. But my calling to build a building is the issue. Yeah. So if I'm cutting timber as part of building a building, then my gifts are important. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Big Whereas we have... In the Western church anyway, we have so emphasized people's giftings that we've forgotten about their call. Mm. So we've had people everywhere cutting pieces of timber and all we've had is piles of timber. Mm. True. <laughs> True. <laughs> Whereas God wants us to build his house. So therefore if people know what their calling is, the gifting will take care of itself. Yeah? Because they'll want to be good at cutting the timber because they've got a passion to do their part of building the house of God well. You understand? That makes sense? Yeah. So we have, we, we have um, uh, you know, in the old English expression, put the cart before the horse. Yeah. Yeah? But if we help people to identify their giftings, sorry, their callings, what we're going to have is in our structure, we're not just going to have senior pastor, associate, you know, assistant associate, and all that stuff. <laughs> We're going to have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and we're going to know, learn how to synergize them and how, how they can complement one another and work together. Yeah. Now, on my team, Deb is our prophet in the house. She won't be the only one. Along the way, God's going to raise up others. Oh. And enjoy the, the, the uniqueness while it lasts. <laughs> Just kidding. <I'm> <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, have, um, we have two pastors who we've commissioned. But we also have a couple of other people who are pastors in our church and have come recently. And uh, the, I guess the time will come when we'll also commission them in the life of their house as pastors. But Enoch's joined us this year and he's an evangelist and church planter. And, you, know, what, you know what I find when we keep our hearts open to people's callings, then we find that everything we need is in the house. That's true. That's and then the structure develops according to the callings. Then the grace of the callings flows. Right? Are you getting this? Mm. Yeah? And you see, the grace is the enabling, and the grace is the life flow. The grace is what produces the supernatural outcomes. Amen? So, um, um, so when we look at these two things, it's incredibly important that we put the two together. We need structure, but it needs to be New Testament church structure, which was about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And I'll talk about how that works and how to develop uh, the teams for needed for areas of ministry a bit later on. But we need a, a need, need a new type of structure, not the world structure, but then we need the, the grace that's on your life that needs to flow within that structure. And we have to gather around us the people who will position themselves under our grace so that the grace that God's put on our life 
will flow to them and then flow out into the church right into your ministry. Yes. Amen? Does that make sense? Yeah. This will produce unity. Psalm 133, verses 1 to 3. Alright? Because people will be united not just in the senior pastor's vision, or not just in the fact that, well, I like this church and so I've got to, I've got to get on with everybody. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? You know, there's, we, we have accepted far less than biblical unity at times. True? Yeah. And we've called other things unity when it hasn't been unity at all. True. Unity is about the fact that we, firstly, there's a sense that um, of divine appointment. And people know this is where God wants me. So it doesn't matter if it's a good season or a hard season. It doesn't matter if, if things are going well or if mistakes are being made. It doesn't matter if there's criticism or encouragement. Nothing matters. This is where God has placed it. Divine appointment. That's the starting point for people. But then more than that, they have to grow to understand how to position themselves as sons in the house, not just servants of the house. When our emphasis is on giftings, all we do is raise up servants. But when our emphasis is on calling, we can raise up sons. Are you getting this? Yeah. <laughs> if, if your emphasis is on people's giftings, you're just going to have a church full of servants. But they won't be sons who have your grace or who know how to position themselves under your grace. All right? But if we identify people's callings and equip them and release them in their calling, the giftings will take care of themselves. They'll want to sharpen their giftings in order to fulfill their call. All right? So that's not a problem. But what will happen is that if we are releasing people and uh, equipping people and releasing them in, in their callings, then they are going to want to position themselves under the grace that God has placed upon us, just like the 70 did under Moses. And so then there's going to be a life flow and a flow of grace and there'll be unity because it'll be a unity of heart. It'll be a covenant unity. It'll be because they've become sons, you know. Now I had a wonderful lunch with my three sons yesterday. And it was not because we just have great relationships so we get together and it's wonderful. It was more than that. It was very significant. You see, um, my sons have been through all kinds of things. There was many years when they were growing up when I was away a lot of the time preaching. But not only that, um, they've experienced a broken family. Uh, they've been through all kinds of things. And so for a number of years I've been, I've been praying that God would do something in their lives. Now they're all, my three sons are serving the Lord. But that God would do something in their lives that they would truly want to be a part of the grace that's on the lot. Yeah. What I'm talking to you about today. Yeah. Now because my parents were missionaries in Papua New Guinea for 20 years, we have... We have a great heritage there. Mm -hmm. And the culture is that, firstly, I inherited influence and um, respect in that nation because of what my parents did there. But then I've had to, in that, I've had to actually earn my own yes. place. But because it's a generational culture, which is actually what the kingdom culture is as well, it's a generational culture, the most appropriate thing that can happen is that my sons go there and begin to inherit something of mine and my parents' thing in that nation, and ultimately that they step in and it becomes theirs. Yeah. So my sons have been through a lot of stuff. There was times when, you know, when, when um, one or two of them didn't know if they really wanted to have me as their father anymore. Yeah. That's how difficult things were at times. But you know, God's done a work. And two or three weeks ago, my oldest son said, Dad, when are you going to Papua New Guinea next? I said, oh, I'm not really sure. He said, well, I want to come next time you go. I said, that's great. I said, let's get together and talk about it. So he wanted to do that yesterday, which actually wasn't the best day because we've just been so busy. But I was not going to miss lunch with him. Because it's significant. But I'm talking about a natural thing to try and help you to understand what happens spiritually mm -hmm. in, in this context, the kingdom pattern. So what he did, my oldest son, he contacted his two younger brothers, said, you've got to come for lunch. Because we're going to talk to Dad about going to Papua New Guinea. So now my oldest son is beginning to be the, 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 uh, the prime mover in this. I don't have to do it. 
And I haven't tried. There's been a few times when I've said, um, you know, would you think and pray about maybe coming with me sometime? I'd love to have you come sometime. I just left it out there, you know? But I want to tell you what's happened. My boys have realised that if you receive your father in the name of a father, you get a father's reward. Yeah. That's right. It doesn't matter what history is. It doesn't matter the pain we've all been through at times or whatever it might be. Yeah. The fact is there's a kingdom principle. That's true. So we had lunch and their wives and their children were there and so on. And, um, and they said, well, how does this work? You know, and I said, well, if we, if we go to Papua New Guinea, we're going to have to minister. You can't just go for a holiday. I said, that would be absolutely um, uh, disrespectful to the people if we just went for a holiday. Very. <laughs> and my oldest son yeah, said, yes, I thought that would be the case. <laughs> so we've talked about what we could do together, the four of us. And we had a fantastic conversation. Do you know how this has come about? It's come about because my sons have realised that regardless of anything that's happened in our family or anything to do with my life or even what some people might say about me or anything else, the fact is that I'm their father and there's a grace upon my life. And that's a God thing. That's not because I'm super dad or something. That's, that's, a, that's just the mercy of God on all of us. You understand what I'm saying today? Now transfer this into what we're talking about to do with the kingdom. It's not because we're perfect. It's not because we're super leaders. In fact, we have to become nothing to get into this. <laughs> we have to be humble. We have to cast our cares on him. We have to lay all our own stuff down and let him be king. You know? We, we have to become nobody. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. True. So that means we've got to lay everything down that's ours. Yeah. But then what will happen is that grace will start to flow when we walk humbly and in surrender and letting him truly lead us without all those preconceived things that we've been taught in the past and all the, you know, the shaping of the Western church and all the books you've read and everything else. I want to tell you something. Mate, I reckon we need to have a Christian book burning. Amen. <laughs> they're all good, but they're not where God's taking us now. No, that's right. It's a new season. He's restoring the kingdom context. He's restoring apostles and prophets and, and, uh, and a new perspective of pastors and evangelists and teachers. And he's teaching us how to work together in a kingdom context, but how to flow in grace, not how, instead of being people who make things happen. Yeah? And how to really see the supernatural flowing naturally in everything we do. And um, so here's the thing. We, my, my boys are coming to Papua New Guinea next year. They'll come. And God's going to do something. Yes, he is. Yeah. Hallelujah. And it's not going to be because, you know, because we're all musicians, we're going to... We're going to be a band, we're going to come and play music. And I don't know if I'll preach very much. Two of my boys are preachers. <laughs> but you know what? They've started to understand yeah. how to position themselves under my grace. Mm -hmm. And they're my natural sons. But you know what? My spiritual sons here in this house, and that includes women as well, mm -hmm. and around the world, are more and more learning how to do that as well. That's right. And we're all at different stages. But I've had to learn how to do that with my apostle. Yep. And the more I position myself as a son under his grace, the more of his grace has flowed over my life and ministry. So true. Thank you. And there is no substitute for this. This is the kingdom pattern. Yes. And so it doesn't matter what denomination you're in. It's about being positioned under the grace God wants you to be under. And it's, it's covenant relationships. And it's positioning as a son. Yes, yes. And that doesn't mean that the person who's older than you, you know, that, that you're positioning as a son under is 20 years older than you. It's got nothing to do with age. Yeah? It's got to do with an attitude and heart. It's a positioning. And so Moses was told by God, get these 70 people who you know. What's he talking about? The word know is about intimate relationship, covenant relationship. So who you've got this intimate covenant relationship with already, get these 70 together. But also, as well as your covenant relationship, they also must have the respect of the people. But I'm going to build this nation in a different way, God was saying, on the basis of the spirit or the grace I've put on you, then flowing to them. And then it's going to change the nation. And the, king, the kingdom of Israel changed as a result of this. It wasn't just a structure with everybody in their place doing their job anymore. 
what happened was that a whole new life flowed into the, into the nation. And you know, I believe that in, in the restoration of the kingdom that's happening around the world today, that this is what God's trying to do. And he's saying, oh, I want to help you change your structure so that it reflects New Testament church. But even that's not enough. The structure alone is not enough. I believe God is saying to his church around the world that he wants to have a, a new grace for you. And whatever the grace is on your life, he, he wants to teach you how to build the kind of covenant relationships with the people around you and help them to, to, to lead in a way that they have the respect of the people, not because of their position and title, but because of the grace that's on their life. Yeah? And to gather them around you so that the grace God's put on you flows to them. Because then it will flow to everybody. Amen? Alright, let's stand and have a word of prayer, shall we?